And in this role, I am the course director of our three year longitudinal community service learning and leadership course. The goal of this curriculum is to expose medical students to the impact that primary care physicians should have in the delivery of comprehensive, continuous, and community oriented care for individuals in medically underserved in the New Jersey area. I am also the New Jersey Area Health and Education Center Program Director, where I oversee program deliverables for our AHEC grant. I also am a psychologist in background, so I provide individual psychotherapy services at our Mount Laurel Family Medicine Clinic. Um, currently, now I'm providing all those services virtually, but at some point I will be in the Mount uh, Laurel Clinic again providing those services. So that is a little bit about me. Um, I'll also just let you know a little bit about my educational background. I earned my doctorate in counseling psychology at Lehigh University, my master's degree at Arcadia University, and my bachelor's degree at Siena College. I have experience in a variety of settings, including college counseling centers, inpatient hospitals, and outpatient therapy clinics. Within my own professional community, I am a recognized resource for working with those with multiple minoritized intersecting identities. I've taught this at the graduate level, I've presented at conferences, and I'm a published author in this area. My research and training interests do include implicit bias and how this contributes to disparities in healthcare, um, as well as looking at intersectional forms of discrimination. So, for example, racism, sexism, and heterosexism. My clinical interests also include working with clients around life transitions, chronic illness, family relationships, um, sexual and sexual identity, gender identity, and racial identity. Um, and um, I also um, provide trainings um, as requested on topics like this. So the objectives today are to be able to define intersectionality of identities and how this lens contributes to increased understanding of individuals. To summarize in the intersectionality of microaggressions and how this impacts healthcare outcomes. And to demonstrate strategies to address microaggressions and ways to reduce negative effects on healthcare. So I just want to stop for a second um, and make a note about the content. To some of the audience members here, this may be new or familiar. And you know, for some of you, this may be the first time you've ever come to a presentation on this. For others of you, this may be something that you've been researching for a while. For others of you, this is your lived everyday experience. So I just want to encourage us all to be open to where everyone is at this topic and be compassionate towards ourselves and others. If anyone has any questions, um, please, there are no dumb questions. I, I love questions that are any type of questions. I feel like always better to ask them than, than to not because chances are someone else has the same question. And I encourage you to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Right, I'm sure there's a lots of things you've heard about um, in this conference so far that have maybe made you think or you know dive deeper into certain things. And just my advice to you is all just to continue to lean into that, and then also take care of yourself as you need to. Again, like I said, everyone who's in the audience right now is in a different place with this content. For some of you, again, this is maybe fairly new to you. This isn't something you've attended. A, presentation like this is something you've attended. And for others of you, this is your everyday lived experience. So no matter where you are on this spectrum of understanding and lived experience, the way you take care of yourselves and the way you need to take care of yourself is gonna look different. So I encourage you to do that as you need to during this presentation, during this conference in general, right? Um, and then yes, we will have time for questions. So just kind of a check in um, just to kind of name the elephant in the room. This has been a tough year. This has been a tough few days. And so just to kind of get us in the moment, I'm just going to ask everybody to do a little grounding exercise. So if you could just wherever you are, if you can, you know, um, being able to be grounded in where you're sitting and just taking a deep breath. Holding in for five and exhaling for five. Another deep breath, holding, and then letting it go. Okay, let's get started. 
So um, as Dr. Chanel, um, you know, defined and really, um, I think, pointed out nicely intersectionality and what exactly that means. And I found this recent quote from an article um, that uh, the the person who coined this term, Kimberly Crenshaw, big in this field, um, started this work and well, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say started it, um, but it became more known in the 1980s, um, giving uh, an art in an interview she recently gave to um, Fox. She notes that intersectionality is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects. It's not simply that there's a race problem here, a gender problem here or a class or LGBTQ problem there. Many times that framework erases what happens to people who are subject to all of these things. So I think when we think about race, when we think about sexual orientation, when we think about gender identity, when we think about nationality, disability, any of these things, I think sometimes we can we can read independently on each of these topics and that's okay. However, I think it's really important that when focusing on each one of these topics independently to really kind of have that intersectionality framework, right? That that knowledge that yes, maybe I'm I'm looking at race right now, but that also somebody is not just their race, right? Somebody is not just their sexual orientation. There is an intersection of identities at play at any given time with some identities being more salient than others depending on where you are, you know, so for example, I'm a, a white cisgender woman. I use she, her, her pronouns. I'm queer, first generation, a psychologist, a daughter, an educator, a friend, I'm a cat mom, right? I have all of these identities and all of them are important. However, some of them are more salient depending on which room I'm stepping into. Right now, if I'm being really honest, my identity as a uh, professor, psychologist, and cat mom are intersecting at one because as I'm talking to you, my cat is calling at the door, right? So, I mean, again, when I'm with my parents, my identity as a daughter, that's more salient, right? And so depending on what space I'm stepping into will determine really kind of maybe what identity is more salient, but those identities are still very much present. For the purposes of this presentation, um, we are going to be focusing on race, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Um, so this, um, it, I think, was titled or is titled LGBTQIA, and I want to be really, you know, clear because I think it's important um, that when we are talking about LGBTQIA or LGBT or LGB. We are really clear on who we're talking about, because I think a lot of times these letters are put together with very good intentions of being inclusive. And I think we should continue to do this. I think it's the more this, the more inclusive we can be, the better. And I think when giving presentations or writing an article, we need to be clear about the focus of who we're talking about. So my research and clinical experiences is specifically working of the, with people who are at the intersections. Um, uh, and experience, experience discriminatory experiences on basis of race, sexual orientation, and gender. So this will be my primary focus. But I do encourage you when reading articles that say LGBT or LGBTQIA that you look at your participant data and see how many T are actually in the study and see how many B are actually in the study. Because oftentimes there'll be a lot of L and G, right? Or, um, you know, um, but very few B and maybe no T, right? But yet that acronym is used. So I just wanna be really intentional about that. Um, and also I think it's really important. LGBT is often put together, but we know that as, as Dr. Chanel pointed out earlier this morning, that we don't wanna conflate sexual orientation and gender identity, they're not the same thing. Gender identity, sexual identity, intersex, um, being an ally, advocate, or asexual, these are all not the same thing, right? And so we want to be very, very um, clear about that. So I have some um, definition of terms here um, that we can go over. Um, and these may be, you know, um, kind of common terms. I, I won't go read them verbatim, but just kind of have them up here on the screen so we're aware of them. Um, 
So um, I do want to just kind of highlight a couple things though. So um, in terms of bisexual, I want to be really clear on this. I think historically it's had a very binary meaning, uh, meaning men or women. Um, but Robin Oak's definition is, is probably by far my favorite. And she defines bisexual as someone who has emotional and or sexual attraction to both men and women and or other genders, but not necessarily to the same degree or at the same time. So bisexual has, I think, historically meant or been perceived as, well, I, I like men 50% and I like women 50% and that's it, right? And it, there is a, I think there are very few people that are 50-50, some are 70-30, 60-40, 80-20, and maybe they're 80-20, one year and the next year mm, more 40 60 right and then so it's 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 ever evolving so i think being flexible in our view of what bisexual means to a particular person and then also transgender is often an umbrella to a term used to identify um the folks that uh whose gender identity does not align with their gender or sex assigned at birth um, queer um, is often an empowering term referring to um, a number of different individuals. And I always say, you know, I think queer is, is a way to explain somebody who, who just has a non-heterosexual and or non-cisgender um, identity. Um, intersex, since, you know, I is again thrown in with the LGBTQI, is used to describe a variety of conditions in which a person is born with an anatomy that does not seem to fit the typical definitions of female or male. Um, and ally, so the A can mean ally, supports rights of others, um, LGBTQ or Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, and asexual, also known as ace, um, is also put in there, little or no sexual attraction to others, little or um, no sexual desire. Um, this doesn't mean that um, those folks don't engage in, in those types of behaviors. Um, again, this is just kind of um, a definition, but um, there's lots of variability within each of these groups too, right? And so there's a lot of variability within the lesbian community and gay community and queer community, intersex community and asexual community, right? And so really being specific that when we're talking to people and individuals that we have an understanding of if someone identifies in one of these ways, what that means to them. So as you can see, there's many different types of words um, to describe. And I think, you know, again, um, you know, just a note about language, it's always changing, right? What was okay a few years ago is not okay now. Um, what's okay now may not be okay a few years from now. Um, and it's, 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 it's forever changing and evolving and that's okay. That's, you know, the more our language changes, the more inclusive we get, which is wonderful. So I just wanna be, really clear about that and think about language that your patient and clients use and use the language that they use and be mindful of what those that particular language means to them. So if someone identifies as queer, okay, what does that mean to you, right? Um, and then just, it's not so much about knowing every right word, but it's about approaching language with humility, knowing that you won't know every definition to every word. Someone might have to explain that to you. You might get it wrong and that's okay. And I think approaching this with humility is, is, is the way to go about it rather than feeling like you have to be right about every single word. These are some more terms um, to find. Um, and I'm just gonna, again, not go through every single one of these, um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about the homophobia, biphobia versus homonegativity, similar, similar concept for transphobia versus trans negativity. If you think about a phobia, right? A phobia is an irrational fear of some kind, right? So when we say homophobia, that's an irrational fear of gay, lesbian, or bisexuality, right? That supports maybe some really rigid gender roles. And if you think about it, no one is actually afraid, like fearing for their lives, like having a panic attack when coming into somebody who is not heterosexual or not cisgender, right? And like, so it's not, that doesn't quite fit. Um, so a lot of um, the terms have shifted in psychology literature, at least to homonegativity, right? Replacing homophobia. So this is negative cognitions about people who are not heterosexual, who people who are not cisgender. Um, and so it, it, cause it's, that's really what it's about. It's about it's it's a negative idea or negative thoughts about 
that community, not necessarily this irrational fear. I do use homonegativity and homophobia interchangeably because of my own like I'm just so used to using that word. So um, I, I, but I, I think it's important to understand that. And then also internalized homonegativity and binegativity, right? So this really begins, and the same thing for internalized transphobia or transform, um, internalized trans negativity. This really begins in early childhood when we consistently hear messages about being othered, right? Um, and so similar to racism, similar. Um, internalized racism is similar. You hear these negative messages about a particular group that you belong to, and then you start to believe them, right? And this can really lead to um, psychological distress and other health problems. And then also, I'm just gonna, a note about coming out. Um, I wanna say that this is a process of accepting identity and it's not like a one and done. I think uh, in the media, there's a lot of like, yes, out and proud, and that's great for some people and that works for some people. and Yes, there are, for some people, great mental health benefits to that. However, there are lots of things to consider when coming out in terms of physical safety, emotional safety, right? It is not always safe and the best thing for somebody to come out. So I think as healthcare professionals, we really need to understand that. Um, and so really meeting someone where they are in terms of that. And then um, also revealing someone's gender identity sexual identity, this is a lifelong process, right? Every new environment that person is, it's a constant process of coming out. So it's not kind of this one and done type of um, experience. So moving on a little bit, I think it's just really important, um, you know, to talk about history. Um, a lot of times I will hear feedback that this is more of a thing of the past, uh, especially when it comes to LGBT folks or race and racism, that this is something that um, is, a, is a thing of the past. And I think um, we need to then, if we're, if we're saying a thing of the past, we need to be clear on what that past is and how that trickles into current times. So, you know, for example, um, the removal of homosexuality from the Diagnostical Statistical Manual declaring that it's not a psychological disorder happened in 1973. And that's not that long ago. Um, and I'm, I'm actually going to make a note about language here. So, um, homosexual is often a term I, I, I hear more in the medical medical community than I do in the, psycho the psychology community because homosexual was the word used to describe homosexuality as a disorder. So while some people might identify as homosexual, it's actually in some communities considered more of a derogatory term because of its negative connotation and because of how it was used in the past. So, um, you know, even as I was checking off, I think it was the survey, I saw homosexual and I, I had a reaction to that because it, it you know, it, it has this negative connotation. So in the literature, you'll, you'll read more lesbian, gay, queer, transgender, non-binary, right, then you will um, read the term homosexual. So I just encourage you to be mindful of that um, when talking about patients, when talking to patients, right, again, kind of listening for how they just, how they identify themselves or asking them. Um, history, heterosexuality has been considered the norm. I, I would say it's still considered the norm uh, as, as well as gender binary is considered a norm. And then looking at, um, history and healthcare in general. And Dr. Chanel, again, really kind of introduced this nicely. Um, we have a long history of um, racial disparities in healthcare for a number of reasons. And I'm just gonna give a few examples of, of kind of where some of this comes from, right? So we, when we say, oh, this was history or oh, this is a thing of the past, I think we just have to be really mindful. Um, and although, conscious bias and bias against uh, minoritized groups goes against the very philosophy of healthcare professionals to serve all people, regardless of identity. Conscious bias has indeed manifested itself in severe forms of abuse within the medical profession. So let's just look at a couple of examples. So, you know, we have James Sims, the father of modern uh, gynecology. Um, he developed pioneering tools and surgical techniques related to women's reproductive health, um, right? And so this is why he's credited as the father of modern gynecology. However, his research was conducted on enslaved Black women 
without anesthesia. Um, and actually, because of this, uh, critics have called for his monuments to be taken down and instead replaced with the women that he experimented on, right? Um, then we have the Tuskegee syphilis study, which took place from 1932 to 1972. Um, this is a historical study often cited, um, and this is this was a study that was conducted by the United States Public Health Service in which hundreds of African American men infected with syphilis were studied to understand the life history of the disease. Not only were the men unaware that they had the disease, but they were never given treatment to cure it. Even though penicillin had become the recommended treatment in 1947. See again, the study ended in 1972. In order to track the disease's full progression, researchers provided no effective care as the men died, um, lost mental capacity, or experienced other severe health problems due to their untreated syphilis. The Tuskegee study demonstrated how bias in this case manifested in the form of racism leading to the unethical treatment of black men that continues to have long lasting effects on the black community because African-Americans and black folks that have knowledge of this study um, have been reported to have higher distrust in research and healthcare systems. We have the Guatemala experiments that uh, went from 1946 to 1948, and this was a US sponsored medical um, research program. So nearly 700 men and women, prisoners, soldiers, and uh, mental patients were intentionally infected with syphilis. Hundreds more were exposed to other sexually transmitted diseases as part of this study without their knowledge and without their consent. The purpose of this study was to determine whether penicillin could prevent not just cure a syphilis infection. Some of those who became infected never received medical treatment. The results of this study, which took place with the cooperation of Guatemalan government officials were never published. The American public health researcher in charge of the project went on to become the lead researcher in the Tuskegee experiments. Sterilization of women of color. This has a long standing history with our medical health systems. Forced sterilization considered a form of to torture by the United Na Nations is just one way in which governments have historically weaponized reproduction, um, reproduction, um, to communities um, that are considered undesirable or expendable as a, na uh, as a nation. Countless uh, Americans, um, particularly Black Americans, um, who were poor or mentally ill, um, who were considered undesirable, were sterilized as part of the eugenics movement that created, um, that gained momentum in the United States um, in the um, 1970s. Um, this program was put in, put forth to prevent quote unquote undesirable from reproducing. So the problems such as poverty and substance abuse would be eliminated in future generations. By the 1960s, tens of thousands of Americans were sterilized in state run eugenics program. Um, and along with a black woman, this was also uh, very prevalent in Puerto Rico um, as uh, thousands of women and men from working class backgrounds um, were underwent sterilizations that, as, as well, often not knowing that these procedures would result in not being able to reproduce in the future. Um, this was also impacted Native American women um, and it is said that uh, sterilization um, happened among 25% of Native American women who were between the ages of 15 and 44 during the 1970s. So again, we ask ourselves, why is there distrust in the medical system? And I think it's important to look at our history for those answers. Um, in looking at the HIV epidemic, um, in the beginning of this, a, the high prevalence of HIV among gay men led to initial beliefs 
that the disease could not be transmitted beyond the gay community. This association really hindered the recognition of dis this disease in women, children, heterosexual men, um, and blood donor recipients. The fact that gay white men were overrepresented in early reported prevalence data likely led to lack of recognition of the epidemic of in communities of color. Today, there's still no clear solution to learning about the epidemi epidemiology of diseases without these imprecise, asso imprecise associations, which can impact um, accurate diagnosis and therapy. Coming a little bit more current, um, the LGBTQ non-discrimination protections removed from healthcare and health insurance um, on June 12, 2020. So the current administration uh, defines sex discrimination as only applying when someone faces discrimination for being female or male and does not protect people from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. What the rule does, this rule focuses on non-discrimination protections laid out in section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. The federal law established that it's illegal to discriminate on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability in certain health programs and activities. In 2016, an Obama era rule explained that protections regarding sex encompass those based on gender identity, which it defined as male, female, neither, or a combination of male and female. Under the new rule, as of June 12th, um, a transgender person could, for example, now be refused care for a checkup at a doctor's office. A transgender man being could be denied treatment for ovarian cancer or a hysterectomy not being covered by an insurer or costing more when the procedure is related to someone's gender transition. This has grave impacts on black trans people and can have devastating effects on black trans women of color in particular. African Americans who get COVID-19 are much more likely to die from that disease than white Americans. A re recent report from the Williams Institute in the at UCLA estimates that hundreds of thousands of transgender adults may be especially vulnerable to COVID-19 because they have an underlying condition or are over 65 or lack health insurance or live in poverty. For black transgender people, this is multiple layers of oppression that could affect their ability to get health care during this pandemic. Okay. So moving forward back to, well, I guess we were just forward, <laughs> but just kind of taking a look at um, other types of um, statistics on forms of discrimination. Um, I've done this presentation a couple of times and I um, update this a chart every time. And so um, according to the FBI in 2018, um, looking at um, experience bias incidents, um, there were 14, uh, 45 hate crimes reported in the US that were motivated by sexual orientation bias. Um, so this is about 6.7% of all hate crimes. So as you can see here, anti-gay male was um, the highest number of victims um, here. And, um, you know, this has been a pervasive problem and this number um, has increased since I started uh, presenting these statistics a few years ago. Um, and I think one thing to be careful of is that this is probably a, a significantly underreporting of the number of victims. One being that because if I'm going to report a crime uh, that has something to do with my sexual orientation, I have to out myself. And so depending on fear of um, heteronegativity, homophobia in the criminal justice system, I may not want to report. Um, and, um, you know, lots of other reasons why I, I just maybe fear, you know, kind of a re, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a re-discrimination re experience if I, if I report this. So I think that's really important to, um, to know. And I, and then thinking about um, just, uh, I saw a question pop up, I'm, I'm getting distracted, but yeah, there is, this is how the FBI breaks it down um, in terms of a, um, like a anti-lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender all together. Um, so I just reported it as they reported it. I also wanted to take a look at um, 
hate crimes reported in the U.S. that were motivated by race, ethnicity, ancestry, and bias. So this is 59.6% of all hate crimes. Um, so when, you know, and just, you know, take a look at the, the actual number here of all um, of these of these different groups that experienced uh, hate crimes. Again, I would even say this is definitely underreported for lots of reasons um, in terms of fear of racism in the criminal justice system. So um, just some kind of something to keep in mind. Again, when we say like it's a thing of the past where we hear that, like this is not a thing of the past. So when we think about types of discrimination, um, some of the discrimination I, I uh, described in previous slide is it's pretty explicit, right? It's pretty out there. Like there's not a question that that's happening. Um, and then we have more subtle forms of discrimination, like implicit bias, which uh, Dr. Chanel talked about in her keynote address, and then implicit bias. Um, and as a result, as a result of implicit bias, we have microaggression. Um, and I'll go into the definition of that um, now. Um, so when we think about Microaggressions. Microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights and insults towards members of oppressed groups. This was this this term was first coined in 1970 um, by Dr. Pierce, and it's been really um, popularized by Dr. Gerald Wing Sue in 2007 in his work with racial microaggressions. I would also say, well, you know, and Dr. Sue has talked about this in some of his writings and some of his presentations I've went to is that microaggressions are kind of the new wave of discrimination, as he explains it. So. <laughs> I went to say, well, it's no longer acceptable to be outwardly discriminatory, although the last few years would suggest otherwise. Um, it has, it has been more kind of, this has been the more accepted type of discrimination because it's more subtle. It's more between the lines. It's more, um, you know, harder to tell if, if, if a discriminatory, discriminatory act actually took place. So this is an example here um, I found in an article. So, um, you know, a man comes into an appointment with his primary care provider. In the exam room, he created, he's treated by Dr. Morales, a Latina intern, who is not his usual doctor. The patient says, you're, you're, you aren't a real doctor, you're too young. I want someone who can speak English. So when Dr. when Dr. Morales leaves the exam room to staff the encounter with her attending, she shares with the patient what the patient said. Her attending, an older white man says, as a woman of color in medicine, you're going to have to get used to that. So we see, we see a couple of intersections here, right? We see gender, we see race, we see age, right? So a lot of things going on here at once. Um, so when we think about a microaggression, uh, you know, we hear, and I'm gonna go into this in a few slides, there's racial microaggression, gender microaggressions, LGBT microaggressions, right? Well, we have like one incident here that has multiple intersecting type of microaggressions happening at once. So just kind of keeping in mind, right, that it's very multifaceted and nuanced. In thinking about the type of microaggressions, right, we have micro assaults, um, micro insults, and micro invalidations. Um, so your micro assaults are kind of like your typical, <laughs> typical, um, your outwardly conscious and intentional acts, actions, or slurs, such as, um, you know, um, or, or displaying swastikas or something like that, right? That's like really obvious. Micro insults are more subtle. Um, they're verbal and nonverbal communications that subtly convey insensitivity or demean a person's racial heritage or identity. Um, micro invalidations um, subtly exclude or negate or nullify the thoughts or feelings uh, or experiential reality of uh, a person of color or uh, somebody who is non-heterosexual or non-cisgender identified. Um, and Dr. Sue really focuses on the, the, the last two because of the subtle nature of them and because of the insidious of them and the daily repeated experience um, that people often face. Um, as a result of micro insults and micro invalidations. And I think when we think about microaggressions, um, we really have to think about impact versus intent, right? Um, impact versus intent. So an example I use um, to talk about this, and this isn't, you know, mine, but I can't 
tell you where I heard from is really thinking about. Right, let's say you're walking to the train, getting ready to go to work and someone steps on your foot while you're waiting on the platform. You know, it was a mistake, honest mistake, ouch, okay, sorry, right? Then you get on the crowded train, well, maybe not these days, but you get on a crowded train and, you know, you're sitting down and somebody standing accidentally steps on your foot, different person. Ugh, it hurts a little more, but, you know, person didn't mean it, whatever. You go, you're standing on the coffee line to get coffee at work. Um, someone accidentally steps backwards, steps on the same foot. They didn't mean it. Oh, it hurts though, because you haven't even sat down on your desk yet and three people already stepped on your foot, right? And now 10 people throughout the day in different instances, instances step on the same foot. None of those people meant to hurt you. None of those people meant to bruise you, but you're bruised anyway, right? And so we have to be aware of the impact that we have, that even though I didn't step on your foot 10 times. It still hurts when I, when I do that. Right. And so that, you know, when we think about microaggressions, you know, I think we need to kind of think about them in the same way. Right. I didn't mean to do it, but I did indeed perpetuate a microaggression. Right. So, um, really kind of being mindful and present and centering the other person's experience instead of our own. And I think this is really critical when we're thinking about maintaining relationships in the workplace, in our personal lives, to really be able to center um, the impact versus our own intent. So, in just thinking of themes of racial microaggressions, um, and I'll break this down in, you know, um, in terms of racial microaggressions, LGBTQ and T microaggressions, and then the intersectionality of microaggressions. So just some themes here um, is looking at, um, so for example, one, um, this was a uh, themes found in a qualitative study. Um, and um, one theme here is alien in one's own land. So really being kind of um, thought to not belong here um, for whatever reason, um, specifically people of color not belonging here in the United States. Um, a second theme here is description of intelligence. So the notion that intelligence levels are really um, dependent on race. Um, so, um, you know, for example, when black people are complimented for being so articulate or Asian Americans are assumed to be good at math and sciences, right? Then there's color blindness, right? I don't see color, I don't see color, all right? You know, everyone is the same to me. Um, is another microaggression. Um, the assumption of criminality. So if somebody is a black individual, they're assumed to um, be a criminal or be likely to commit crimes. Um, and then also the myth of meritocracy, right? So um, thinking about uh, when white people deny that race influences success and supports the notion that everyone moves forward based on talent and hard work, right? Saying that if you know, people, black people and people of color just pull themselves up by their bootstraps, everything would be fine. Um, another theme being uh, path pathologizing cultural values and communication styles, right? So centering the white the white perspective and that that if you, you don't align with that, then something is wrong. Um, and then also being viewed as a um, second class citizen. That anyone who is not white or um, is not is is not worthy of the same benefits that white folks are. Really um, pervasive mental health outcomes um, as a result of racial microaggressions have been found. So depressive symptoms, higher levels of anxiety, underage binge drinking, suicidal ideation, lower self-esteem, and lower levels of psychological well-being. Here are some themes of LGBTQ and T microaggressions. So heterosexist and transphobic terminology. Um, this was these these themes were found in a qualitative study um, looking at these things. So thinking about, um, you know, the many kind of uh, phrases or things that um, perpetuate heterosexism. So like that's so gay or, or things along those natures, that nature. Um, heteronormative or gender binary culture and behaviors, right? So it may be assuming somebody is straight unless they tell you otherwise or assuming someone is cisgender unless they tell you otherwise. Assumption that because you're queer and you're queer, you must have the same experience, right? Um, and what we know about within group differences is that is sometimes a lot more different than um, between groups. Um, exoti um, being exoticized, right? So um, depending on how you identify, um, 
discomfort or disapproval of the LGBT experience? So because that's not my experience and my heteronormative or, or my cisnormative experience, then I don't know that uh, I'm so approval. I'm so approving of that. Um, also denial of societal heterosexism. That's a thing of the past. Like you have so many rights now. That was a recent thing my partner heard at work. Like you have so many rights, you have no reason to complain. Right. Um, assumption of sexual pathology and abnormality, um, denial of individual heterosexism and transphobia. Um, there's also an under sexualization, meaning that I'm okay with you, but just don't talk about your relationship because I don't even want to think about you having a sex life. Um, for trans folks, denial of bodily privacy. So because now you know that someone might identify as trans or, or gender not binary, thinking that you can then ask questions that are really personal about um, about their uh, sex organs or whether or not they're you know getting um, you know surgery and and it, and yet you have no no relationship with that person to be able to be asking those questions, um, and then research in. Um, Research with bisexual individuals um, found uh, pressure to change. Don't pick one or the other. You're either straight or you're gay. Um, and folks experiencing uh, heterosexism in the um, straight community and then also experiencing discrimination in the uh, queer community for not being gay, queer, or lesbian enough. Similar to racial microaggressions, um, outcomes such as anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, lower self-esteem and psychological distress are reported in high levels with these um, populations. So um, just in thinking about her health outcomes continued, um, this uh, LGBT discrimination and psychological distress has been found in um, multiple samples. Um, so when we think about um, who, how this, how discrimination and psychological distress affects folks. This has been found um, in predominantly white sexual minority women and men. This has been found in African American, Asian American, Latina, and Native American folks. Um, this has been found across the board in different um, populations of people. Um, and one thing to note is that um, we do know that LGBT folks do experience higher rates of mental health um, negative mental health outcomes and uh, health care disparities. And it's important to think about the stress theory and minority stress theory when trying to explain why that is. So, um, you know, myth, there was always the myth that, oh, because you identify as LGBT, like that is why you have a mental health illness or that is why you're having these physical health problems. Um, but with the stress, uh, minority stress theory posits that it's because of the discriminatory and stigmatizing environment that these folks are in, which is causing the mental health and health disparities, not the identity itself. Um, outcomes continued looking at intersectionality of oppression. So research on gender, gendered racial microaggressions with Black women found that these women um, felt that um, reported that uh, assumptions of beauty and sexual objectification was often made. Um, they felt being silenced and marginalized. They often experienced the stereotype of being a strong Black woman and or the stereotype of being an angry Black woman. In research looking at Black, gay, and bisexual men, um, they reported feeling um, racism in uh, their queer communities and hetero and experienced heterosexist microaggressions in their um, black and brown community. Here are some themes of intersectional microaggressions and I think as you can see um, it's similar to racial and LGBT and uh, LGBTQ and T microaggressions. Um, and I think um, it's really important to look at both separately and also see where themes of intersectional microaggressions also come up. Um, so I'll just read a couple here. Assumption of inferior status of men of color, invisibility and desexualization of Asian men, assumptions of inferiority and criminality for men of color, gender stereotypes for Muslim individuals and women of color as spokespersons, right? So some are some are similar to the other ones we saw in the past, but some um, are, are different when we look at the intersectionality of microaggression. So, in just looking like how does this affect healthcare and patient interaction? 
Um, in, in some studies, looking at white providers who score high in implicit bias, but not explicit bias when interacting with black patients. So doctors have been found to speak faster, dominate conversations, have shorter visits, play fewer non-positive verbal cues, and use first-person plural pronouns. So these are all examples of microaggression, right? They're unintentional, things we don't think we're doing, but we're doing them, right? In thinking about the effect microaggressions and implicit bias can have on rapport, um, emotional rapport is central to patient-centered care, and this, in some studies, have shown that it independently predicts Black patients' trust in providers. Um, also, Black and white disparities in the quality of providers' emotional rapport have been well documented in primary care settings, with folks presenting with uncontrolled hypertension and presenting with depression. The study also found that when race and socioeconomic status became salient in the encounter, research shows that providers may demonstrate shifts in attention to focus on racial features, expressions of automatic, inaccurate, negative stereotypes, heightened physiological threat responses, and anxiety, um, and avoidance overall of discussions of race and racism, also microaggression. So I think we have to think of, you know, taken together, all of these things being common barriers to healthcare and why, again, going back to our history in healthcare, working with these populations. Also, health insurance, thinking about, you know, who has access to health insurance and who does not, what does health insurance cover now versus what it did. Um, also, previous negative experiences with the healthcare system, we cannot not be affected by all of these things, right? It, this is like the air we breathe. Plus a bias and perceived uh, negative stereotypes, right? This is, we all have them. I've given this talk a lot of many different times. I still have them. I still have to work on these things, right? And so if I'm somebody that has had repeatedly negative experiences with healthcare providers, and there's a history of healthcare being against me, literally, right? This is going to impact then my reaction or my feeling in the healthcare office. And while you as, you know, future physicians or current physicians, maybe you didn't cause the problem, right? Like I never did that, right? We are still responsible for doing our part to understand the impact that bias microaggressions have on folks, both in the physical, um, both in their healthcare and their mental health. Um, so what do we do, right? And so thinking about what we do, um, and I know I only have a few minutes left, um, thinking about a framework, um, and I draw this from Dr. Sue's model of cultural competence, um, is really building on our awareness, knowledge, and skills. So awareness first and foremost of our own assumptions, values, and biases, right? What, what was race and racism talked about in your home? Maybe that was all you talked about. Maybe you never talked about it, right? What were the messages about LGBTQ people, um, what what kinds of, you know, when you think about your family, your religion, you know, your, your schooling experiences, what were these messages, right? Because all of this stuff, all of this stuff got ingrained in our minds, right? And how does this, how does this come out in your everyday and really doing that work to really understand, okay, where are my biases? Where are my blind spots? That is the first most critical step of all of this work, right? And then there's the knowledge piece, right? So do your reading, do your research, really understand about these different groups, about the history, about previous, um, you know, healthcare um, systems, right? Now, with this knowledge, that doesn't mean, right, that we take that knowledge and then apply it to, uh, you know, if I, if I do a lot of reading on Black and lesbian women of color, Black and lesbian, you know, um, sorry, <laughs> black uh, and lesbian uh, folks, right? If I do a lot of this intersectionality research and then in my office, I am with someone who identifies as black and identifies as lesbian, right? I don't wanna just apply all that reading I did. Okay, well, you must fit all of this, right? Because one size doesn't fit all. There's a lots of, again, within group difference. So while knowledge is important and I don't wanna discount that, we also have to, like figure out what these identities mean to the people in front of us, because what it means to one person might be different for somebody else. So we constantly just have to approach that with humility and really, really kind of being open 
to learning and growing and understanding what identities uh, and what these labels mean to the people in front of us. And then skills, right? We wanna use appropriate intervention strategies and techniques. Um, so I'm gonna skip that. Um, um, but one of the things I, I wanna point out, and I use this slide in my CSL class, is that, you know, each of our patients, you know, they come in with specific symptoms, right? And we wanna fix the problem. But at any given time we're in a room with a person, our patient has different identities kind of swirling up there, almost like, you know, thought clouds, right? And, and so do you. You're gonna have, that, that's for you too. So we wanna always kind of think about how the intersection of identities is even interacting in the room with your patient, right? So, you know, my religion or how I grew up in my family might interact with how my patient identifies or lives their life, right? And we just need to be aware of those things, right? So when we, these biases come up or these automatic thoughts we have of, we you know where they're coming from. And I'm just going to skip some of the knowledge because I kind of said all that. I think it's also really important to understand the protective factors too, right? And so knowing what are some protective protective factors for the community, so collective action, so being involved with um, whether that's discussion groups or political activism or um, you know listservs, right? We know that collective action can also help. Um, be a protective factor. Social support. What are what are these? What are what does your patient's social support system look like, right? What is your emotional openness to, you know, processing your patient's feelings of being discriminated against in certain contexts? Um, and then again, thinking about you know, um, hope and optimism for the future. Like this, you know, having that hope and optimism and knowing that you know things. Um, that there's a lot of resilience in these communities. And then also thinking about protective factors coming out, again, not a universal resilience factor for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. So just kind of thinking about strategies to, um, to really kind of be able to address bias and address microaggressions is really stereotype replacement one, right? So if you have a stereotype in your mind, picture the opposite. Right, and make an association with that opposite stereotype. Um, this is kind of along with counter stereotypic imaging. Um, individuation, like I've been saying, like see how that person identifies, see how that person defines themselves, um, and really put yourself in that other person's shoes, uh, perspective taking. Increase contact, volunteer, read. Um, you know, when you think about doing your next rotation or your clinical experience, like. Go into a community that you're not familiar with. Really increase that contact. And then partnership building. Working with patients is a partnership. It's a team sport, right? You are the physician, I'm, I'm, I'm a therapist, but we are working as a team to figure out what the best route is to go with that person. So really looking at it as a partnership. Um, I think also here in healthcare um, settings, basic understanding of your patient's culture. Um, and I've kind of went through some of these already. And then, you know, what also kind of lastly, what can we do? So creating a welcoming space, um, you know, is your non-discrimination policy visible? What are the signs in your office? Literally, I know me, when I go into a new doctor's office, dentist's office, any office, like professional office, I'm looking around, like where are, where is one little message that something is going to affirm me, right? Is there, is there pamphlets on LGBT or LGBTQ and T like, um health or groups what does your website look like like is there do i see myself reflected in any of this right um as a as a healthcare provider establish trust and rapport right Get, you know and i think folks that are going to primary care obviously myself as a therapist like we have more of an ability to develop this over time um and i think that is, is so critical when you think about patient um physician relationship, um, asking open-ended questions and not assuming anything. Someone asked me where the bathroom is, I tell them where the women's bathroom is, where the men's bathroom is, and where the, you know, the, whatever, the unisex bathroom or gender neutral ba bathroom is, whatever it's called in that particular office, right? I don't make any assumptions, no matter how someone presents to me. Um, and using really gender inclusive language, right? Not assuming someone's partner uh, uses he or she, maybe they, maybe they use they or them, maybe they use the, right? And like, so really kind of understanding, like, not that, that idea of not making assumptions. 
and then just being aware of specific issues related to um, folks with multiple identities, um, particularly LGB, UNT communities. That's it, let me a few minutes over. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you so much um, for joining. Um, I don't know if we have, I know we have some time. I'm happy to answer any questions or if folks want to email me, that's okay too. Uh, thank you, Dr. Birch. Um, there are uh, two questions that came in. Uh, one was, um, you know, given the limited time we have with patients, uh, how do we, how do you generate safe space for them to comfortably share their identity and sexuality? Mm, that's a great question, um, and I think that that is a, a common question because in the healthcare profession, you're constantly moving from, you know person to person. Um, and I think it's just really being present with that person, right? So like, I know myself, I'm, uh, you know, I'm always go, go, go thinking of the next thing, um, but just being really present um, when you're asking questions, asking open-ended questions. Um, I think it's a lot of like solid communication skills and nonverbals. I can't, you know, again, I'm, I'm gonna come from my own perspective, but maybe that's eye contact. You know, maybe that's not in your head. You know, it's a, a stance of being interested, right? I mean, a lot of our communication is nonverbal. Um, and so just being taking a real interest, like I see my PCP and like, I like her and everything, but every time I'm talking to her, she's typing, she's typing. And I know she has to do that. And, you know, I get it. And also like, I don't really feel a connection to her because she's never really looking at me. Um, I don't think she knows that really anything about me. So, um, you know, how are, you know, even thinking about everything that's going on right now, like acknowledge it, how are you doing? You know, this week's been tough for a lot of people. How are you doing? Like, and being genuinely interested. Um, that's a great question. Great, thank you. And then the last question was, um, you know, how do we address microaggressions from our colleagues towards other yeah. patients? That's a good one. That's a really great question. Um, so I guess I would wanna know, I mean, Oh, so that can, that's a big question. And I think it really depends on your relationship with that colleague, I think, and it depends on what they're saying, right? So if they're saying something um, really overt and really like obvious, you know, I think it's, a, it's certainly okay to address it in the moment and say, hmm, let's think about that. Or what do you mean by that? Or I think a lot of times um, when I hear microaggressions from colleagues, I'll address them one-on-one. -on -one and say, hey, like, you know, I noticed, you know, you said X, Y, Z, what did, what did you mean by that? Or um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? I, I, I try to come from a place of curiosity instead of um, like accusatory um, and, and really kind of understand where they're coming from. And, you know, let's say I was right, right? They're coming from a place that wasn't so great. I might be like, well, you know, I'm not sure, you know, I perceived it like this. I don't know if other people might have perceived this like like that. I also am very, um, what's the word? I I could have made, you know, I, I know that I talk about microaggressions a lot and I also commit them and I know that's gonna happen, right? And so a lot of times, sometimes I, I might share an experience like, you know, I, I know I've said things like this in the past and actually, or I thought this in the past, but then I learned this and someone told me. So, you know, I mean, so I, I also try to own in conversation with folks that I'm just susceptible of making mistakes. Um, and it's not just me coming to you telling you, you did something wrong, but I, I do think it, it depends a lot on the power dynamics, the different identities of yourself and your colleague. Um, and so a lot goes into that, but I think, um, you know, I try to do a one-on-one -on -one conversation um, and, and try to kind of see where that person's coming from before um, assuming that they're coming from a bad place. Um, even, but that's a lot harder um, to to say than do sometimes. But I'm happy to, you know, if anyone wants to talk more about that at some other point, I'm happy to meet with you or talk with you. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Rich, for, you know, talking to, about this topic with everyone. Um, uh, for everyone that may still be here, I am currently posting uh, the link to the uh, interprofessional panel, which starts about four minutes. Um, so feel free to head on over there um, once this is over. Thank you, everyone.